Hello everyone, welcome. It is Tuesday, February 15th, 2022. I almost said 2015, I don't know why. Anyways, um, welcome to episode 234 of Woolen Spinning. It is so good to see you. Thank you everybody for being here this afternoon in the live chat. You guys are already chit-chatting up a storm. It's so, so good to see everybody. We've got some new faces as well as our regulars, which is good. Welcome to the Patreon community. You guys are the ones that are in the live chat. You you guys have access to the live chat. It's so good to see you. I hope that you're having a wonderful week thus far. And um, welcome if you're a new viewer of the podcast and you're just checking us out for the first time. Thank you so much for being here. And to those who are returning viewers who check out the show week after week and, and are faithful viewers, if you don't mind taking a moment to like and subscribe, I would really appreciate it. And thank you for continuing to watch the show and to support us. It uh, means a lot to me. So I have not a lot of projects to share with you that are actually like in progress, but I do have a whole bunch of planning that I've been doing. I don't know if you guys have felt this way this year at all. I, I, I would love to hear um, from you guys what how it's been for you. One of the things that I've really struggled with this year is just feeling like the year never really started. So at the beginning of the year, every year, I generally will sit down and spend some time um, deciding what I want to work on for the year. I'll put together a, a make nine. There's, you know, things that I just kind of like to work on and to do. And I just didn't feel that this year. I just couldn't get a light lit under me at all. Um, I felt like the year 2021 didn't really end. 2022 didn't really start. We had this weird snow and rain and hail and ice and it was just weird. So here we are in mid-February and I actually have started to feel inspired again. And I've actually started to feel excited about things and, um, I felt like I was plugging away on projects that I was really enjoying and now I have an empty loom and I have, um, actually that's not true. I have two empty looms. I've got the jack loom free, but I've also got my table loom free. However, I did put the table loom away. I put it in, it's, um, it com came with a case and I did put it away because we are starting to uh, Mike is going to be starting renos. Um, so we're going to be ripping up our floors and our baseboards and so on. So it's going to be um, just kind of, you know, it's going to be a bit chaotic around here for a while. So I thought if I could put some stuff away, then then maybe I that would be helpful. Yeah, I've heard that joke before, um, Zan. <laughs> um, that's because I... I, I, it's really good if it's written out, um, but I don't know if you guys have seen the meme um, that 2022 is not a great year because it's 2022. <laughs> so um, it's very, very clever. I feel the same way, Dij. So Dion was saying, um, I feel like 20, uh, 2022 is flying by so fast. I, I'm feeling that as well. Um, it's just, just crazy. That's wonderful. Sam just finished, she just emptied off her, uh, she calls it her, her Felicia, it's her, her floor loom. Uh, she just emptied it off as of about an hour ago. That's fantastic. So, um, yeah, so I finally sort of, now we're here in like mid February and I'm just kind of feeling finally like I'm excited about things again and like I'm actually wanting to work on things and I'm actually like making some forward momentum and, and coming up with some projects that I want to do and just a couple of things that I'm, I feel like excited about. So that's been really positive. And uh, I thought that I would share that with you guys today because you guys keep me accountable to actually getting these things done as well. So uh, that's really helpful. Um, it is really good to have everybody here. I'll just say some quick shout outs. We've got... Um, Dagmar's here and Dana and Charlotte. You guys were early. It's so good to see you. Sarah and uh, Sherry is here and Zan. Vicky is here. Um, Dana, our other Dana. We've got quite a few Danas in the community actually. Uh, Martha is here. I was just thinking about you this morning, Martha. I'm wondering how you were. Uh, it's funny that you would be here. So I'm glad that you're here. <laughs> um, Dion is here. Eve and um, some of one of our other Sarahs. Sharon is here. Allie. Sam, 
uh, Amanda's here, Brittany is here, Kathy, Julie, my goodness, everybody's here this morning. Michelle and Glenda and Becca is here. Good to see you guys. I hope this time isn't too late. I know for the UK cohort, it's nine o'clock your guys' time, but hopefully it's only an hour. Most people go to bed between 9.30 and 10.30, I think, um, out there in the, in the world that is the real world, there I am going to bed at 8.30. Um, everybody else, however, I think goes to bed at a regular time. Uh, Elizabeth, San, uh, who else is here? I think I, Christine, I probably missed a bunch of people, so I'm very sorry. But it's good to uh, see everybody. So I'll tell you what I've got my my works my my project planning that I've got that I'm thinking about. Uh, I've got some hand spun stuff that I'm excited to start, which is really actually well overdue and really needed. And um, I don't have any works in progress to share with you today. I threw my works in progress that I'm working on in the live chat. Sorry, in the show notes, which is linked down below. Uh, you can get to the show notes in, in the link, the link just below in, in the box. Um, so I did throw them in there, but I don't really have any progress to share with you. So I, I, I thought we would skip that today, except for one thing um, that's on the loom. And yes, it is hand spun, so I'm allowed to talk about it. <laughs> um, and then, and then we've got a whole bunch of community participation. So let's just get into it because we've got a big, big show. So it's really neat to to read through the live chat actually because um, there's a bunch of people that would like Christine for example she said previously she could only watch when she had a weekend off um, and then other people like Mia it's 10 p.m. where she is so are you a night owl like you know for some of you guys I know it's um you are night owls so it kind of works it's the end of your day um, yeah so I, I'm I'm happy to move the stream around a little bit like sometimes be at noon sometimes 11 this is all Pacific sometimes at 1 p.m. Um, but uh, yeah it's nice to have a, a steady time and day so that people know what time um, yeah oh that's awesome so Sam just pulled off her first twill gamp I know it was my fault <laughs> um, but that sounds wonderful I'm excited to see photos in the in the slack channel um, all right so while waiting for the end of covid we missed the start of the new year i don't think you're wrong dagmar i think you're on to something there yeah i think a lot of us for a lot of uh, at least out west here um omicron was just hitting and we were just kind of starting to have new shutdowns again and uh, i think christmas wasn't really what people had expected um, in terms of like restrictions and whatnot so i think here it just sort of felt like we went from dreary november into dreary january um, i think that very much was the case uh, Dagmar is a night owl. That's awesome. I never go to bed before two in the more in the night. So 2 a.m. So 10 p.m. is perfect. Oh, that's good to know. Um, Amanda, you must be tired. She's been combing fleece all day. And I think it's 10 p.m. where Amanda is too, actually. Is it 10 p.m.? You're an hour ahead of the UK, I think, aren't you? So let's talk about some of the things that I have planned to talk about. So I think what I'll do is I'll flip over the screens. And then we can just go through like systematically. So one of the things that happened a couple of uh, weeks ago, I was, or it's been kind of brewing in the back of my mind. I have quite a large stash and it got really good for a while there and I was really able to whittle it down. And then it started to sort of get out of control again. And I think it's just been like, you know, bringing things in and bringing things um, in for like teaching content to facilitate stuff for you guys. And then there's been um, extra stuff that I've wanted to do. And then I was in a couple of fiber clubs because I wanted to support some indie dyers through COVID when the really big restrictions were still going on. And it just kind of kept adding up. And I'm up to about, oh, I don't know, um, 14, I think 14 or 15 bins of fiber now. And they're not massive bins. 
Um, I have one here that I can show you. They're not huge. They're like this size. So they're not huge. Um, this looks bigger than it is. It's not that big. I mean, when you look at it compared to me, but I've got like 14 or 15 of them now and they're all full and it's kind of like, it's enough, you know? Um, I, I've kind of, I'm at the point where I'm like, nope, I'm, I need to start emptying some of these out and I need to actually start getting to like, be able to see the bottom of some of this stuff. So, um, the first thing that I've been working on that has kind of sparked this whole other idea is this. So I'll let you guys look at some pretty pictures while I, while I talk. Uh, so this is Sweet Georgie Yarns, uh, BFL Silk, and this is in the colorway Tofino Road Trip. And for those of us who are from the West Coast out here and who've been to Tofino and spent any time in Tofino, uh, know that like you can pull these colors out pretty easily. They're, they're just totally those colors of, of that, uh, Pacific Rim rainforest. So, um, I bought this at the beginning of, of, of COVID. Um, there seems to be a theme here today. And uh, I was with my friend Rebecca, who I don't think is here yet today. I know she's planning on uh, joining us, but I don't think that she's here just yet. But she was here. We were at the Sweet Georgia studio for the last time. They were shutting down the next day. And um, the um, that makes me laugh, Sherry. And they... I saw these two braids of the, of the road trip and I thought I'm going to spin this during COVID and while we're in these sort of lockdowns and shutdowns and so on and I didn't get to them. So I'm spinning them now. I've talked about the yarn quite a bit. It's a three ply fractal. The plan is that once it's plied and finished that it will be somewhere between 20, 20 and 22 wraps per inch. Uh, on the wheel it's register. It's sort of when I do my plyback test and stuff, it's about 22 wraps per inch, but it, I do expect it to poof at least a little bit. Um, there's only about 15% silk in there. The rest is BFL. BFL is not a particularly poofy fiber. It's not like Targi or Polworth or, um, uh, well, those are the two big ones that really poof up and really sort of fill in those gaps and have good bulk when they get washed and finished. But BFL is, you know, it's sort of a longer wool, um, but it still has that sort of the, the reactivation of the crimp will bring it back a little bit and it will, it will, there will be a little bit more loft in the yarn once it's washed and finished than it has when it's freshly plied and freshly off the wheel. So I was sitting there spinning the other night and I was looking at some stuff and I was spinning and each of these bobbins it, for a three ply fractal for about 75 grams per bobbin has been about three hours of spinning for each bobbin. Like if I were to sit down and just spin straight through and not have any interruptions and no stopping, it would be three hours of solid spinning per bobbin, probably actually a little bit more. So it's been an intense spin to say the least. And of course I'm spinning very fine for a finished three ply of 22 wraps per inch. So uh, the, the singles are about 45 wraps per inch. And so I'm just kind of in that sloggy kind of, you know, trying to finish it off. I literally have about this much fiber left. Like I'm down to the last little bit. I almost got it done this morning in virtual spin group, but I didn't quite get it done because I was, queuing up everything for today's live stream while we were chit chatting. And um, over the last week or so, I stumbled on some really great photos and I don't have them to show you, um, but I will try to sort of put together a montage of some different photos that I felt inspired by because it's more than just one or two projects from one or two people. There's been multiple projects that I've watched from a few different people playing around with different stuff. And Kelly actually posted one of the photos Okay, we are going to start off where we left off and I'm not going to go through a whole intro um, because it's already quite late. So um, I hope that this is going to work. I, we, we're not going to do community participation today. We'll just kind of pick up where we left off, but no guarantees. So this may or may not work. Um, okay, so... Um, big stash. And what I'm going to do when I release the show um, this week, um, after this show, um, I'm going to, uh, um, there won't be any live chat or any, um, I'll call, I'll, I'll take the two, um, 
live streams and I'll put them together and then I'll upload that and that will be the show. So there's sort of this interruption that's happened in the middle because we had major technical issues and then um, we'll go from there next week. There, Mike, when I got on the phone with Mike, our tech support, <laughs> I called him, I'm like, Mike! Um, but I had actually gotten it working on this end al already, but I just wanted to talk to him like, what happens if it happens again? Is it worth it to go live again? Or should I just punt, record it and upload it um, without trying to do live chat um, and like the live stream? We think that the battery in one of the cameras needs to be replaced. Like we're pretty sure that it's just gotten a bit old and just needs a new battery. So, and it's not holding its charge, which actually would make sense. Like this stuff gets old, right? So um, now I'm back to the, so I'm using my webcam um, because it has audio as well. Um, so that's hence the sort of crappy, crappy video, but that's okay. Cause you guys are here for the photos. <laughs> so, um, so what I was saying was I've kind of amassed this, this sort of stash. And I know Sherry had said in the previous chat that, um, um, you know, that, that my 15 bins were like nothing compared to her stash. So I appreciate, um, you know, that that's, that that's the case that a lot of people are sort of, you know, staring down the barrel of, of large stashes. And I, I, I really get that. And um, I think that was something that I had sort of started to think about was like, I, I really want to sort of get on top of some of this. And, and um, I, because the thing is what I have, I really want to use. And so it's sitting there and it's staring at me and I like, I want to, I want to use it and I want to get into it. So this Tofino road trip had me going into my stash and uh, sort of thinking about what could I put with this fiber that would work really well. And that was why I was telling you guys about these projects that I have recently sort of stumbled upon that I had really loved. Um, and one of the commonalities that they have is that they're, they're sort of this main color, this yarn um, in the warp and sometimes also in the weft, but then it's sort of flanked by white. And so like whether it's a woven singles or a woven plied yarn, they've got the color going through the warp, either every pick or every other pick or every third pick or every fourth pick. There was a great fabric that um, Kelly, who's here, um, had posted um, that she had found um, that it ended up kind of looking like um, like confetti. Um, and it was going through the whole thing and it just looked awesome through the fabric. And I've, I've been thinking about that ever since. And then I stumbled on a couple of projects on Ravelry, a couple of projects on Instagram of people who've done similar things with their hand spun. So I went into my stash to find um, some roving that Eve had sent me a while ago and it's this BFL Beaumont. And I've already done a spin with the Beaumont um, alpaca that was 50 50 and now this is bfl beaumont 50 50 and i thought what a perfect match to go with the tofino road trip which is the bfl silk so uh even i think that this is probably about 225 grams which is sort of perfect and what i'm thinking about doing is spinning it the same way as the tofino and uh, so it'll be a three ply it won't be a fractal because you know it's all white um, and then in the warp in the weft alternating pick for pick and end for end the Tofino road trip and the uh, the white and I thought you know what an amazing piece of fabric that would create so that is one of the projects that I'm kind of project planning right now and then the other big one that I'm project planning is Andrea Maori's new sweater. So this is metamorphic. It was just published in the last couple, last week or so. And this is the yarn and I had it on the other camera, but of course I've moved that camera now, but this is, um, the West coast color Falkland. And I spun this during right at the beginning of COVID. It was like right at the beginning. And I actually threw a link in the show notes, which are linked down below in, in the box. Um, I finished this April 7th of 2020 and I actually spun it over about a week. I started it on Nora's birthday on uh, March 29th of 2020. And then I, um, finished it on the seventh, on the seventh, like that's how much spinning I was doing. So I know I included some photos, but I really love this yarn and it's been hanging off of one of my branches that's sort of scattered around our house. And I, I thought, you know what, I'm going to take this down. I'm going to put it back into skein form and I'm going to put it somewhere where I have to see it all the time. And then Andrea published that, that pattern and that sweater. And I thought, 
bingo, that's perfect. However, I need a contrast color to go with this. So the sweater is really deceiving, but it actually uses two colors. Uh, Falkland is sort of a, it's a fine wool. It's very bouncy. There's really good bulk to it. It bounces back right away. It's a really, really lovely, uh, fiber. It's one of my absolute most favorites to spin. Um, I think Katrina's one of her favorites to spin is Targi and my favorite is Falkland. So both fine wools. Um, but I just like that slightly longer staple of the Falkland and I like, I just love it. I love Falkland so much. So, um, I'm thinking about my CVM, my gray roving um, that I had done. I used the taupey brown um, for the background for the main color of my spark cardigan. And I'm thinking, and I have another half fleece because I had split them with uh, Greta. I have another half fleece that was gray. And I thought what a perfect Mary of these two to work towards that. So two big spins coming up that I'll just kind of work my way through for the remainder of the year with the goal of uh, knitting this sweater. That's kind of the long-term plan. It's very similar to the Weekender. She's just changed the collar a little bit and changed the upper part of the sweater. Um, but I really like the effect and I had the yarn already spun. So I've got more than enough yardage and I just have to do a little gauge swatch to make sure I'm not too far off with my gauge, but I think I'm, I think I'm okay. So thank you, you guys for coming back. I'm sorry about the, um, the hiccups with the uh the live stream if something like that happens in the future and you're not a part of the slack channel um wait like five ten minutes and um refresh the patreon post and the post will and the link will probably be there if i was able to get back on um so there's no other way for me to kind of communicate with people if um they're not in the Slack channel. And I know that the Slack channel isn't for everybody. Not everybody wants another place to have to check stuff, but it, it does mean in the Slack channel, I can be in direct con conversation with you guys really quickly and get in there right away and say, hey, this is a new link and we're up again. So um, if you're on the fence about the Slack channel, that's one advantage, but uh, touch wood and blue, we haven't had technical difficulties for a long time. So uh, um, I am very, very thankful for that. But I think Mike and I've been doing this for long enough and I've been doing it for long enough and I'm very techy um, that we've kind of worked out a lot of the kinks, which is really good. So um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Eve said it was very generous of Rachel to give us an interlude so that I could grab a cider. <laughs> you're, you're welcome, I guess. Um, oh, Dion bought the pattern as well. So we'll have to, uh, we'll have to do a little uh, knit along together, Dion. Yes, thank you, Dagmar, for sticking with me and for coming back, you guys. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so that was um, the second thing that I am planning. And then the third thing that I am planning, I will go back a bit and show you these. So these, um, I kind of stumbled on these on Instagram, and I've seen them a few times because I follow Amanda on Instagram. And uh, I've linked her website and everything in the show notes so that you can get to everything. And I've, I've linked the coasters like themselves. And I think she's Amanda Rattage, like at Amanda Rattage on Instagram. Like I think that is her Instagram handle, I'm pretty sure. Anyhow, I was scrolling through the other night and I just thought, you know, those would actually be a great project for these random skeins of yarn that I found that I pulled out of my stash. They're Herdwick and they're very crunchy. Um, they're not over spun. It's just the nature of Herdwick yarn. It's, it's, it's a, it's a rug yarn. Let's call a spade a spade. A spade is a shovel. Herdwick is a rug yarn. It is great for rugs. Um, this one's a little bit softer. This was a bat that I got from Sarah Elizabeth Fiberworks. And um, it's Herdwick, but it's got other stuff in it. So it's not quite as crunchy. Um, it's been skeined for a very long time. I spun this back in probably 2018 or 2019, but there's lots and lots of texture in there. So you can see that these coasters are contrast. So they're a weft faced fabric. And what that means is basically you warp the loom and the warp is spread out a little bit more than you would maybe do for a balanced 50-50 where you can see all of the threads going lengthwise and you can see all the threads going across. But with a weft faced fabric, you have your threads going up and down spread out a little bit so that your threads going across can actually lay on top of each other very, very closely. Think like tapestry. If, you, if, you, if you're not a weaver, 
you at least know what tapestry is. That's sort of the idea is that the, the threads are covering, they cover all of the warp. And what you end up seeing are the yarns that are left, which is all of the weft yarns that are laying on top of the warp and hiding the warp. And I have these two yarns in my stash and I thought these would be perfect to use up. Now, you guys are probably thinking, but Rachel, they're not high enough contrast and you can't do X's and O's, the pattern that's in on these little coasters. You can't do that pattern with those two particular yarns because you won't have enough contrast. You're absolutely right. So my, I've got some stuff in my stash. I've got some really great, like, you know, really hardy, toothy wool um, in my stash that, um, that I thought um, would be really great to spin as contrast. So they're very, very, very dark. And these would act as sort of the background and then the darker yarn, the darker wool can, can go on as the X's and the O's. And, and I'll end up with sort of two sets of coasters because I can just weave until I run out of yarn. So this is another long-term project. So you don't need a lot of yarn for these, which is really nice. And she put on a warp of, I think she put on like a 1.6 yard warp. Like it was very, very, very short. And uh, I just thought what a perfect way to use up some singles or use up some yarn, but also have the opportunity to spin some more stuff out of my stash. So that is, um, that's this. And actually it's funny because on the camera holding them up here, not, not so much in the photo, but holding them here, they actually do have contrast because one's a blue and this one's gray with hits of like rusty orange. And this one's gray with hits of blue, but they're still not different enough to be used in the, um, in the coasters. So that's okay. I'll do a third really, really dark, hopefully almost black if I can find it in my stash when I'm thinking of I'm just hoping I still have it and that will be the contrast for those so super super fun I wanted to delve into sort of playing with weft face fabrics I love the look of things like croaked bract and I've got tapestry coming up for my unit four in the fall and so I just sort of thought I'm going to start sort of tiptoeing my way in and just dipping my toes if you will into um sort of some um some other sort of weave structures, some other fabrics, but with the caveat of doing it with my hand spun. So that that's the key. Thank you for your uh, patience, you guys. I see people have found us, which is so good. So thank you. Dana said she can't stop thinking about that sweater too. So she's planning on knitting one as well. So you'll have to jump in with us too, Dana. And, um, uh, Yes, uh, t I knew I had missed a, a question. Thank you, Kelly. Um, she said, is the Tofino Road Trip a colorway? It is a colorway. Uh, it is that colorway, the one that I was talking about. The Tofino Road Trip, That it was that colorway. Yes, I love Herdwick sheep. They look so cute. I agree with you, Sam. They are cute, but their fleeces are toothy. <laughs> they are toothy. Um, just did a tapestry workshop at Guild a couple of days ago. It was loads of fun. Um, rug yarn spinning buddies. Yes, go Amanda. You now have to compare notes for the coasters. I may, for those coasters, I may become a weaver yet. So funny. Um, oh, no way. So Dana has a lovely horse named Exo. That's cute. Um, the coasters, um, I'm actually going to throw these on my table loom. I'm not going to try to warp up my, uh, my floor looms because I would lose so much warp. And um, it's such a short warp anyways. I'm hoping that I'll have two sets of coasters to pull off because I'm hoping for about six to eight for each set. And um, I think that uh, I could do um, a lot more and get a lot more of the warp off by um, doing that on my, on my table loom. The other thing I was going to mention is the white of this pattern. Um, so the white part that's the fringe and the hem stitch and there's four picks of the uh of that white before you start weaving this stuff the the uh, x's and o's in the background um it's just four eight cotton so you guys probably have four eight cotton in your in your stash and i was actually thinking about i've got some gray four eight cotton and i was thinking about using that instead of the white so just a little bit more muted a little bit duller um not quite so white <laughs> Um, I could also do a hearth mat, a heart mat and alternate the skeins, a hearth mat. And, oh, that's not a bad idea. Huh. I, 
have a plan for a table runner for some hardy yarn that I spun up. That's a great idea. I think I think there's definitely a use for these yarns and, and dipping our, my toes into some sort of rug type things that maybe isn't a rug for the floor, but you know, coasters, um, a hearth mat, like, uh, like uh, Charlotte said, I think this is just some great, great ideas. So thank you, you guys. And then the last thing that I was uh, planning this past weekend was, uh, and then we'll talk about some of my, my works in progress. I don't have any major works in progress to show you, but I have a couple. One of the things that I have to do for my GCW, which is the Guild of Canadian Weavers uh, Basics uh, certificate, which I'm working on right now, is I have to show a good use of uh, M's and O's. So M's and O's is a weave structure. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a weaving pattern, a weaving draft. I included it to show you so that you would know what I was talking about, especially the non-weavers in the crowd. And I went through my stash of 2.8 cotton, all of the tubes that I have, and I laid them all out. This is on the floor in our bedroom below my warping board. And um, I'm just going to do a random selection of uh, yarns to be able to weave up some towels of M's and O's. So uh, I don't think that my final project for the GCW is going to be tea towels. That's not one of the options that they give you. I think it's a baby blanket, a stole, a scarf. There was a fourth option. Anyways, it's all sort of, you know, pretty, pretty standard um, um, textiles and pretty standard pieces. But I thought, you know, I've never woven M's and O's before. I don't really know what I want to do with the um, selvages on the side. Do I want to have a couple of picks of plain weave? Do I want to, you can't really do that because of the way that the M's and O's draft works. I'm going to need floating selvages. What's that going to look like? I've not woven M's and O's before. This is very complicated. <laughs> So I thought, nope, I'm going to do something where I can kill a whole bunch of birds with one stone, um, even though I don't believe in killing birds, um, The where I can have uh, projects made for June for the kids' teachers and tutors, and also um, have something that I can keep for, my, for ourselves um, and throw into my sort of tea towel stash, if you will, with some samples of sort of where I want to take this project for my actual basics. Um, certification. So that is what this is all for. So I'm just going to do some, pick out my favorite colors. I'm just going to warp it up, work on warping over the next couple of weeks. I'm going to do quite a long warp. This is going to be a very, very long warp. It's going to go onto the jack. It'll be at least 11 yards at least. Um, and I think that it will be, um, that will give me about, um, I think I had calculated the other day. It was like 36, times 11 divided by, I think each towel was gonna to be roughly 30 inches long. That is not the right math. Three divide, divided by, um, yeah, I think I was hoping that I could get between 11 and 12 towels off, and that would give me a set of four for us to keep. Um, a couple of Christmas gifts to put away, so like Christmas in July, um, and then the, the kids' teachers. Um, which is, I need four towels for the kids' teachers, one for each of them. So I can do that. That's not a big deal. 12 towels is actually really good off of an 11 yard warp. I've, I've done that before. And it's really nice because you get all these towels and you have um, a fair number of um, like samples, stuff to keep. If you mess up one or two um, and you don't want to bother fixing them, you just keep them for yourselves. You've still got leftovers. Um, it works really well. So that will go onto the jack. That will go onto the four shaft um, table loom. If you notice at the bottom, so we'll just talk about weaving for just a sec. If you look on the uh, bottom right hand corner of that draft, let me just get rid of this other photo here. And let me make this bigger so that you guys can see. So uh, one of the things that I had messed up about when, uh, with my candy cane towels, when I had initially found that draft and I had played around with it and adjusted it, when I initially was looking at it back in 2019, right at the beginning of 2019, I didn't know what I didn't know. And I didn't know what I was looking at. 
But now if you look at this draft, so there's four boxes on the bottom, on your bottom right hand corner. So it's the opposite for me because I'm streaming. You'll see there's the one of the, that's, that's all the, the squares, there's some rectangles and it looks like it's the graphic. That's the drawdown. That's what the fabric is gonna look like. And we know that that's the case because if you look at her weaving right here, this is from Marcy Petrini's website. I've linked it in the show notes. Um, these are all free. You can download these and you can c collect all of her PDFs that she's done. Um, the, uh, you can see that that's the draft because then you see in her weaving, in her photo, it matches. Right above that in those pink one, two, one, two, three, four, three, four, one, three, one, three, that's how you thread. So all of your heddles, all those loose strings that hang on each of the shafts of your loom, that's where all the threads go through. And then on the other side, on the far right hand side, are the, the green numbers. One, two, one, two, one, two, three, four, three, four, three, four, one, two. Those green numbers, that's what your feet are doing on your floor loom. They're lifting shaft one and then two and then one and then two and then one, two, three, four and then three, four and so on. And so that's what your feet are doing um, or your feeties as James would say. Your feeties, my feeties are doing that. Now, if you're trying to figure out if the loom is doing it, if you need four shaft or if you need eight shaft or if you need two shaft, that's the little tiny box with the black and white numbers. So that's the one, two and the three, four. And this pattern is a four shaft pattern. And the way that we know that is that we look at our, at those numbers and we only have up to four. And it recommends having six treadles, but we, when you look down at the treadling, you actually only need four treadles. So I think actually you need five, one, two, three, four. No, you only need four. So you need one of your treadles tied up to shaft one and two. You need one of your other treadles tied up to shafts three and four. And then you need another one tied up to one and three, and then another one tied up to two and four, and you're good to go. So, um, very straightforward. It's just nice to actually put this stuff on the loom and work it through because um, it's great to study it. It's great to read it. It's great to understand it. But what do you do when you actually have to know it? You have to immerse yourself in it. So um, I will throw this onto the jack. It's a four shaft loom. And uh, I know that I don't need any more shafts and I don't need my spring because of reading that draft and understanding finally how to do that. I did not know how to do that a couple of years ago. So feeling pretty good about that. All right, shall we risk it? Should we go a bit further and talk a little bit more about some of the other stuff I was gonna talk about? <laughs> I'm a bit nervous to like risk it. Um, okay, so a couple of the things that I've been working on, let's talk about something. This is hand spun. This is off of my uh, spring right now. So this is on my spring and this is from the book, The Next Steps in Weaving by Patty Graver. I have linked that in the show notes. And oh, thank you, Dion. She said I explained that very well. And um, I really appreciate that. When I explain something really well, if you guys can let me know, that's great. Cause then I try to remember that that's how I explained it. And then I can explain it the same way again down the road. So I actually really appreciate that kind of feedback. Um, this is from the book, uh, Next Steps in Weaving. So I had my friend Kelsey, and if you don't follow her on Instagram, I don't know if she's very active anymore, but it's Kelsey Tremblett, um, at Kelsey Tremblett on Instagram. Her, photo her photography is amazing. Her weaving is unbelievable. And I don't know how much weaving she's still doing. They've, they've moved back to Alberta. But um, when I was talking to her about um, getting going with a floor loom and getting going with weaving, and I was still on the rigid heddle, and I was just getting the jack, and this was all happening in 2019. And um, of course, dad was palliative, and it was just, there was a lot going on. She turned to me and she said, don't worry about it. Like, you're gonna, it's gonna be fine. Get the book, Next Steps in Weaving by Patty Graver. Now there's going to be a rush on that book and just start at the beginning and work your way through and weave everything. And by the time you're done, you'll be really well-rounded and you'll understand a lot of the basic weave structures. You'll understand summer and winter. You'll understand Huck. You'll understand Bronson. Uh, you'll understand Overshot. You'll understand uh, all of the twills. Um, and she said, just, just work your way through from the beginning, start at the beginning and just go all the way through. So I haven't done that. <laughs> uh, I fully intended to, that was absolutely my plan. 
However, uh, I, I've gotten a little bit sidetracked and a little bit distracted and there's been other things and I progressed a lot quicker with a few other resources that I didn't expect. And I certainly never expected to be joining in on the OHS Unit 1 back in the summer. When that opportunity came up, that, that completely um, threw me. I wasn't expecting it. I didn't anticipate that at all. Um, I'm incredibly grateful for it. But one of the projects that kept coming back to me again and again and again was this overshot sampler. So it's very small. I talked about it last week a little bit, but if you're stuck with where to go next with it being a beginning weaver and trying to get going, I would highly recommend getting this book. And now that I've woven a few of the samples that were from the book that were like the rote, kind of this is what you do, these are yarns that are called for. So it was uh, 10 to cotton for the warp. And if you're not a weaver, these numbers don't really mean anything. It's totally fine. Don't worry about it. It's just really fine. So the white is 10 to cotton, mercerized cotton. So it's the shiny cotton. It's not the matte cotton. And then it called for this uh, weft, uh, 3 to cotton, mercerized. Um, it's shiny. It's okay. Um, it's been fun to play with. I haven't, I haven't played with that weight of cotton before. So it's been, it was fun to play with. I made lots of mistakes and um, there's treadling errors and whatnot. But then as I was progressing, I was like, I need to pull out some of my little bitty bits and bobs of hand spun and start playing with that. So that's what I started doing. So this is actually kettle dyed Cheviot from socks that I did years ago. And I don't think that I can like ran, like randomly try to get the photos up of it and show it to you, but I will try to remember to link it. Actually, I won't remember. I will, I won't try. I will remember to link it in the show notes for you guys so you can see the socks. They got felted. They got thrown in the washing machine. They got thrown in the dryer by accident. They would have been fine if they only went through the washing machine, but they got thrown in the dryer by accident. They were my favorite socks that I had ever made. I was heartbroken. Um, but I had some of the yarn left over and I, I had kettle dyed this yarn myself and it was sort of just an experiment. I was just playing. I didn't really know what I was doing. I felt like Chevy, it was probably a good yarn to start with because to start sort of playing around with, um, kettle dyeing because Chevy, it, it's, it doesn't felt really, really super easily. It clearly does felt at least a little bit. And, um, if you push it hard enough. So I just threw the link in the live chat, but of course, when you guys are watching this later, you won't have access to the live chat. So um, uh, I'll put it in the show notes below. So I will I will link the, the socks that I had originally made in the fiber uh, in the show notes. So just look, as you go down the show notes, look for um, on loom, uh, the Cheviot sampler, or sorry, the overshot sampler, and then I put the hand spun ends. And then I went through my stash and I can't really reach them, but. I found a whole bunch of other stuff. This is just a few of them, but I found a bunch of other stuff that's sort of in my stash. This was um, Into the World. Um, the camera's not great, so it's not gonna be able to pick up these photos very well, but or these colors very well. But I thought, you know, I'll throw, I'll play around with some of this stuff as well and just play around. See, um, I'm looking for yarns that are about 16 wraps per inch. That seems to be what works really well to get a, a balanced weave where the white, the background, the, is which is plain weave, is a balanced 20 ends per inch and 20 picks per inch. Um, if I went with a thicker yarn, it didn't really work and I pulled it out. And if I went with a thinner yarn, it, it didn't work either. So the 16 wraps per inch, give or take a little bit, seemed to work really super well. Um, Eve was asking, is the book for a four shaft or eight shaft? It's for four shaft. And, um, looks like floor and that looks like Florentine embroidery. Um, not sure if it's a version of Bargello or something different. It's just the way that the blocks weave. Cause yeah, it does look like Bargello. Um, my mom has made Bargello quilts over the years and they literally look like this where you have the moving blocks. Um, and it's done with twill, um, overshot and all different types of threading patterns and all different ways of explaining it. I will spend some time. As I get more comfortable, I will spend some time um, on Welford Weaves, um, sort of explaining Overshot and, and giving you guys sort of a little bit of, um, helping you understand a little bit about what, what Overshot is and, and the structure and, and whatnot. For those where it's just an introduction, you're just, just kind of starting to figure it out. 
because that is certainly where I am at. I'm just starting to figure it out. So yeah, I adore the colors of your hand spun weaving. Thank you, Suzanne. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, yeah, it is four shaft. I'm, I'm positive. It's a great book. Uh, Sam says hers is next to the bed. I'm not surprised. Um, it's one of those books that sat next to my bed for the longest time as well. And I just kept looking at it and I kept reading through it and I kept, um, explaining it and, or like, um, uh, coming back to it again and again and again. I think she explains things really well. I do think that there are a few, um, I'm saying this in a, in as constructive a way as possible. I think there are some things that could be explained a little bit more fully, but if she had, the book would have been massive. So I think that you need to plan to also reference other sources for certain things. Like it really is just kind of an overview of what you can do next and giving you on a platter some really perfect projects to be able to use as a jumping point to taking that particular structure further. So, you know, these are the twills. The, these are some of the things you can do with twills. Um, these are some of the things you can think about to start to uh, push your knowledge um, in, in fr away from just plain weave into uh, learning about twills here's a project and then she kind of goes on to the next thing so um and then if you want to go deep with the twills and you want to go to the next the next level then you progress from there so yeah the overshot samples in the book don't have good contrast so that makes it harder to totally agree uh there's a couple of photos where it's really hard to tell what's happening in the in the samples themselves um that was one of the other things about the book i think that could have been improved was the photography because sometimes there's photos of something where you're trying to get an idea of what that thing is and it's not photographed from far enough away does that make sense sometimes it's great to have photos that are right in close and they're really detailed and they're right there and you can really see but then you need to also be able to see what the thing looks like and so it needs to be, the camera needs to be pulled away, the, the, uh, the, the, and, and the thing, whatever it is, needs to be photographed in completeness. And I think that's lacking as well. So, yeah. All right. Uh, there was one more thing I want to share with you guys. So I pulled this off yesterday. I am incredibly happy with it. It is my final twill gamp. So this was part of the Sweet Georgia, School of Sweet Georgia uh, weaving twill on four shafts. Felicia had come up with a sort of a, a draft and a gamp as a jumping point for people. Um, it is, if you want to, it is also uh, something that you can use for your GCW for your twill gamp study, which was of course what I had, why I had already started working on mine and planning mine. Um, it's done. So this was my fifth one. It is my final one. Um, I ended up weaving this at 20 ends per inch, sorry, not 20, 14 ends per inch, 14 picks per inch. And um, I ended up originally, you guys will remember um, the original samples that um, um, I had done. I had used that darker brown as the uh, in-between. And actually, if you guys want to wait a second, I will throw in a photo of what the previous warp looked like. So the previous warp was the darker picks and it was four picks running in the uh, warp and then you do four picks between each of your patterns. So you've got this sort of squared off um, pattern in each row and it's uh, divided by these four picks of, of straight twill, one, two, three, four. Um, what did I want to say about that? I, my original, see, this was my original color. So you can see the difference. Um, this is much quieter. It's much more muted. It actually increases the, the, uh, value. Um, this actually, in, by, by taking out that dark Brown, it actually increases the overall pieces value. It brings it closer to white than to black. Um, whereas before it was sort of more medium value. And, um, I think it's just a little bit easier on the eyes. It's not quite as high contrast. And when you see it up close, I, I found personally, it was easier to see what was going on in each square because the, the darker Brown wasn't sort of jumping out at you as like these really bright frames. Um, if I was weaving something for a project that I wanted to be more dramatic, I would not choose this lighter sort of, um, salmon -y kind of 
camel color. Um, I would definitely go with the brown, but I just needed to just bring it down a notch. And this was my original color combination plan. So I kind of went back to my original idea. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say about it was I was really happy in the end with what I chose for my uh, additional eight. So you, you had to choose, let me just find the bottom right hand side. So there, this is the right side. And um, you had, this was, you start off with your straight draw, 0.12, broken 12, which is here. And then um, I chose bird's eye 12 for my fourth one. So you choose what's in your fourth column. And then you weave those trope as writ or as drawn in. So that's basically what's going on in your in your threading is what's going on with your treadling. So you basically take your threading and then you treadle it. Um, so I start off with a straight draw, 0.12, broken 12, bird's eye 12. I love this. The bird's eye 12 treadled on the um, straight draw. I love that. I don't know why. There's just something about it. I just love it. Anyhow, and then you had to choose four that are your own. So the final four that I did were my own. So I ended up doing um, extended 0.12 M's and W's, uh, a, a, a bigger repeat of broken twill. So this one was two, three, four, one, three, four, two, one, four. Yeah. Um, so two, three, four, one, and then three, two, one, four. So that creates this pattern here. And then finally, I did Rose Path. So really straightforward, um, really happy with the results. And um, that is done and dusted. So that means I've got my color gamp done and I've got my twill gamp done. So I'm really, really, really happy about that. So happiness all around. Looks so beautiful, Rachel, inspiring. Thank you, Suzanne, that means a lot. Um, and just catching up with chat. Um, I know we've lost a lot of people from the uh, podcast being, um, having to be re regenerated and the link having to be regenerated. So again, I'm sorry about the technical issues this week. Thank you so much, Charlotte, for your kind comments about the uh, the gap. Thanks, you guys. It's nice to have it done. Like, it's just nice to have to have something else sort of finished and have have the loom free, right? Like knitting needles free, loom free. It's just awesome. Um, <laughs> Christine, she says, I'm, I, I'm amazed at how you've embraced such a steep learning curve when it comes to weaving. So it's, thank you for saying that, Christine. I don't think that if somebody had told me back in 2016, when I first got my very first rigid huddle, if somebody had told me six years ago, that weaving had this steep of a learning curve, I'm not sure I would have given up my rigid heddle. I'm not sure that I would have left rigid heddle weaving as quickly or as willingly as I did to move on to uh, a floor loom. Um, I was so excited to get onto a floor loom and I had that opportunity to get onto the 27 inch Jane and get onto the, the table loom and Jeanette from my uh, guild, who's also the Jeanette that Jane Stafford talks to off camera sometimes, that is the same Jeanette. She is lovely, she's an amazing person. And um, she was just so encouraging. She was like, it's gonna be fine, you're gonna be fine, it's gonna be okay. Like the, this whole world is gonna open up to you, like just do it. And I remember seeing her going, oh, okay, okay, sure, yeah. <laughs> if I had known, I'm not sure I would have been such a willing participant, but in the other hand, ignorance really is bliss because you just don't know. You don't know what you don't know. What has been more challenging and what has been trickier is there's all of this information out there and there's, there's all of these places to find this information or theoretically there is, um, but a lot of books are out of print. Um, there's not a lot of information online. There's, there's more, and there's starting to be more, but there's not a ton. And it's not a topic that you're going to master in a few years. It's not something that you're gonna to come to and be like, oh yeah, I got this. Oh, this is good. I'm gonna be fine. I'm gonna get this project done and this project done and I'm just gonna be trucking along. Because the thing is, is like once you've done that project and you've mastered that thing, then it's like, oh, but what if I do this? And what if I do that? And what if that's not how that, 
what weaves up if I change x, y, and z, or maybe if I only change x. And what do you mean this is only one structure within this entire category of weaving? And what do you mean I now have to make a profile draft? And what do you mean there's I can weave it in three different ways as overshot, crackle, and I don't know, what's another one? Overshot, crackle, or monk's belt. Like it's, it's a whole other language. It has its own jargon. Um, the, the equipment is highly specialized. The yarns are very uh, specific and they're very different from what we teach for when people are first coming to spinning. So that's a whole other learning curve that we haven't even talked about yet on the podcast. Um, because we teach spinners to spin knitting yarn, not weaving yarn. So how do we teach how to spin weaving yarn? How do we do that? I don't know, you guys. Tell me. <laughs> and then I'll do it. Tell me what to do and I will do it. Um, and so I think that we've got um, a whole untapped sort of area of learning here that you either go into it with a really open mind and really humble and say, I don't know what I don't know. And I'm just going to try to learn what I can and take in what I can when I can and then leave the rest of it behind in the sense of like, I'm not ready to take that on yet. I can't, I can't absorb that yet. So I will get there when I get there. And then also being a bit fearless in just trying this stuff. Like I've never woven twill, like this would be an example. Um, I've never woven twill before. I don't know what it is. I have a four shaft floor loom. I've not really done a tie up on it before. But there's this yarn out there that's a 4-8 cotton that everybody says is pretty easy to weave with. And if you're not in an area of the world where you can get it easily, ask somebody what a substitute would be. You know, another smooth yarn, a linen or a bamboo yarn or maybe a smooth wool. Um, and just don't make any changes to the draft. Don't make any changes to the pattern. And just follow the instructions word for word. And just go through the exercises of like, for example, the, the, um, the four shaft twill gap on the school of sweet Georgia right now, or the first season projects on Jane of staff on Jane Stafford's online guild and just go through and don't try to start reinventing the wheel. Don't change the set. Don't change the yarns too much. Um, just go through the exercises because the thing is, once you start to learn about set and you start to learn about how these yarns act and how they behave, what your feet are doing, um, it all starts to fall into place, but you have to just give yourself that space to just do what you're told. Because with weaving one mistake, um, it, you know, putting your, setting your yarns too tightly, setting them too open, um, not beating, um, um, sort of firmly enough to create a nice fabric, all of those things will result in a, a project sort of not working out. <laughs> so just do what they tell you to do. Um, there are not many references out there for spinning to weave. Yeah, I think Sarah Lamb's kind of the only one that's been doing it where she's really actively spinning to weave and talking about her process and doing, doing her thing. Um, there's, so there's Sarah Lamb, but she basically only does... Um, um, silk. Um, but spin the spin to weave class that she did is excellent. And then I'm thinking of get weaving with Sarah. She does, uh, her last name is not, is not, um, Sarah, what's her last Howard, Sarah Howard. Is that right? Um, her stuff is great because she's actually publishing sewing patterns to use with your hand spun hand woven fabric and all of the fabric is done on a rigid heddle. So you can work on your rigid heddle and be successful, which is wonderful. I wish um, I had known about her when I still had my rigid heddle. I think I would have tried a lot more because um, I just didn't want to keep weaving scarves. That was just not what I wanted to do. So yeah. I have a giant floor loom in my basement and it scares the heck out of me. I bet Mia, but I would love to come over and play. <laughs> I would love to, to play with you and figure it out together. Definitely want to get better at spinning for weaving. We'll be talking more about that as we go. Um, we have a couple of people in our guild who spin almost entirely for weaving and it's super interesting. I would love to talk to you, Becca, next time I'm talking to you. I would love to talk to you um, or maybe send a, send a note, send me a note. What are some of the key differences that you notice in the way that they talk when they're spinning to weave versus when we talk and we're spinning yarn. 
to just knit with or just to spin yarn. Like there is a difference. I have noticed a difference and I would love to hear from others um, what they think some of those, those key differences are. Cause it is, it's super interesting. Yeah. All right. There's a coat that Dion wants to make. That's awesome. I want to make a coat too. We've got lots of alongs to do, Dion. If you guys haven't checked out Woolen Spinning Radio this month, it was with Dion. So I hope you guys check it out. And oh, thank you, Charlotte. So it is Sarah Howard. Definitely check out Sarah Howard. She's based in the UK. I have a couple of her patterns. Hopefully we'll be getting into those in the next uh, couple of, couple of, well, probably in the next, within this year. I was going to say a couple of months, but probably sometime in this in this year maybe with this yarn maybe with my tofino road trip yarn maybe once i get it all woven that would one of her patterns would be perfect to to use that yardage because i have two of her one's a v-neck t-shirt and one is a tank top that i think is a v-neck as well or maybe i got the round neck yeah i would love to use uh the woven yardage that i'm going to do with this for that so um yeah, less elasticity for sure, Eve. Um, but I don't think the higher twist necessarily. I'm really starting to kind of tiptoe back from the whole high twist thing because after my experience with my unit one stuff and some of my experiences with um, the stuff that I'm working on for the, for the GCW certification, honestly, the yarns are not high twist at all. They are barely held together. So... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite so sold on the whole high twist thing anymore, but we can talk about that more next time. So, um, I think there's a difference in density in knitting yarns versus weaving yarns. That's a really good comment, Dion. I think weaving yarns are much denser, not maybe not much, but they are denser for sure. I think that's a really good comment. Yeah. Um, Sarah Howard, get weaving with Sarah. She has a lot of her patterns on Etsy. Um, so definitely check those out. So. It just needs to be strong enough to make it through the weaving process. That's exactly it, Amanda. We were just talking about that a couple of weeks ago. I think you're bang on with that comment. I think you're absolutely right. So, okay, guys, I'm going to say goodbye. I hope you have a wonderful day. This will be a little bit delayed in coming out and being released because I will uh, put the two episodes together, the two live streams. I will put them together and I will uh, render them and I will upload them for this evening. So if you're looking for the podcast and you haven't found it yet and you're just you've just watched it and you've just found it. That was why there was a delay. It's because I wanted to put the two together. So I will leave the live stream, those two links, I will put them in the show notes once this is all fixed. Um, so that if you want to go back and watch the, with the live chats, there will be two part one and part two. Um, you can absolutely do that. Cause I know some people really love watching while they're reading the live, the live chat. I have to admit I do. <laughs> so Technical difficulties aside, um, I will fix it so that you can watch the episodes straight through or you can watch the live, the live chats, but there will be two parts. So until next time, happy weaving and happy spinning and happy knitting and happy just dreaming up all the projects. I hope to see you guys here next time, same time, same place at Tuesday, 1 p.m. Pacific next week. And until then, happy making and I'll, I'll see you guys then. Bye everyone. <laughs>